so we got speaker height. I feel like that's how tall I am. All right, and then got that. Good evening, music lovers. All right. Tonight, I'm going to whisk you through 100 years of songs and features of American novelty music. What is novelty music, you may ask? <laughs> novelty songs are jokes in the form of a song. Like any other joke, these songs have a setup and a punchline. Often, the beginning of the song will sound normal through the verse, and the chorus will bring the punchline home. Right now, you're seeing the beginning of a setup of a novelty song. Let's see where the setup takes us. I have a sad story to tell you. It may hurt your feelings a bit. Last night, when I walked into my bathroom, Stop there. We'll stop it there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So that is such a good audience. So that's the first verse and chorus of Shaving Cream, uh, made by Benny Bell in 1946. Has a number of elements that pop up in American novelty music. He almost swears. Uh, it's a waltz in three-four time, and it covers a taboo subject. In this case, bodily functions. Uh, other common elements in comedy song lyrics are nonsense words or nonsense descriptions embarrassing confections and, uh, confessions and uncommon objects of affection. But where did, these object, where, where did these elements start to accrue? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the music publishing business in America. Tin Pan Alley uh, is the name of the music business in New York City from the late 1800s to about the 1920s when people started buying records instead of sheet music. Um, it was the nickname of a particular block, 28th Street between Fifth Avenue and Broadway, where a number of publishers were located. Uh, these songs were created to perform in li live vaudeville and variety shows, uh, sung on the radio, and then sold to the public as sheet music to perform in their own home. So when you talk about the great American songbook or American jazz standards, a lot of them come from this time and place, from composers like Irving Berlin and the Gershwins. Composers in Tin Pan Alley were known as song pluggers. Uh, Tin Pan Alley songs come in three flavors. Uh, first are dances. Uh, these are meant to be played so people can dance. Um, they might have lyrics, but many were instrumental. The hot style at the time was ragtime. Uh, the second type is ballads. Uh, these cover your standard sentimental heteronormative love songs. Um, also patriotic ballads related to World War II like God Bless America and Over There. Uh, the third type of music being produced by song pluggers was novelty music. Uh, the big novelty hit in 1918, 100 years ago, was Kuka Kakati, about a soldier who is brave enough to go off to war, but who nervously stammers when talking to the cute girl next door. Let's hear the chorus. Kuka Kakati, beautiful Katie, you're the only Kuka girl that I adore. When the m -m -m moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the Kuka kitchen door. It's nice. So uh, novelty songs, they can either be in the form of a ballad or a dance song. It's the lyrics that set them apart. Um, so the sheet music cover and the title need to sort of telegraph the joke so people know that they're buying the joke song. Uh, another huge novelty hit around this time was, yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. All right. So um, it, it spawned a nearly identical song called Hey, you got any codfish? We only got mackerel today. <laughs> um, as well as, I got the Yes, We Have No Bananas blues. Um, so <laughs> when I talk about novelty songs in this talk, I mean comedy songs. Um, but there are often very novel things in these comedy songs, and that's for a good reason. Um, a punchline is an unexpected resolution to the setup, one that you didn't predict, but that fits. 
Um, so you need to be unpredictable, and you, so to do that, you include new elements. In a song, that means new or rare instruments or singing about the hot new thing. And you may not know <laughs> about Sam Zamuri's one-man quest to make bananas popular in the U.S. in the early 20th century, but bananas were a novelty 100 years ago. Um, other novelty elements around this time were waltzes, uh, songs with or about ukuleles, and songs about Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, these are all real. Uh, so, because, um, because these novelty songs are talking about something new, both the song and the topic are often a flash in the pan and become that strange monster called the one-hit wonder. Um, I pause here only to say that these categories above are not inherently comedy songs, although they may not have, they may have novel elements uh, and some may have intentional jokes. So the genre or origin of the song is not really what counts. Um, a lot of songs are meant to be entertaining or, or perceived as jokes in hindsight, but for this talk, I have a spe specific criteria in mind. Um, one is the artist's intention. Um, there are a lot of cover songs these days where you switch the genre, but it's not to make the song a joke, it's just a, a new interpretation. So Postmodern Jukebox or The Rockin' Toys. It's fun, but it's not funny. Um, so we're looking for a good setup and punchline. These don't really count. Um, the other element would be the execution. So this is where our lovely Florence Foster Jenkins fits in for this talk. Um, so she considered herself a serious musician, um, but it was her career was undermined by her execution. This is also where Friday by Rebecca Black goes, the execution may make the audience laugh, but it's not the artist's intention. We want to focus on the people who wanted to tell a joke and did successfully tell a joke. Um, it's okay though, because Rebecca Black, she's in on the joke now. Check her out again, she can sing. She's, good. she's a good woman. Um, audience perception and listenability also factor in, but let's move on. So uh, comedy songs could just have silly words like in the sheet music days, or they could just have silly sounds, but often they have both. And similar instruments appear again and again. A lot of oompa band instruments, jug bands, toy instruments. Um, very, very briefly here, we have a kazoo. <coughs> we have a duck call. <coughs> and uh, a nose whistle. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, comedy songs also often switch from one genre, tempo, or rhythm to another. Um, Weird Al once explained that his polkas, which are medleys that transform pop hints into two, four farces, were inspired by the terrible power of the accordion. He said, when you play, when you play the accordion, every song you play ends up sounding kind of like a polka. That was the running joke when I was a teenager. None of my friends wanted me to join their rock bands because I played the accordion. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, now we know some features to look for. Let's talk about the man of the century, Spike Jones. Not Spike Jones. Uh, although this director's nickname comes from our Spike Jones here. Uh, Spike Jones was a percussionist from California who played in traditional big bands and had a successful career as a studio musician. But one day he had a revelation that led him to transition into novelty music. One day he saw Igor Stravinsky conduct the Firebird Suite. The Firebird Suite is a very serious, heavy, dramatic ballet, and every time Igor stood up or moved, his leather shoes would squeak. <laughs> and this tickled Spike, and Spike realized you could have a lot of fun if you put intentional mistakes and funny sound effects in the empty spaces in songs. And thus was born Spike Jones and the City Slickers, a band of professional musicians who are amazing at their craft, but were happy to make silly noises, wear loud suits, and invent props like a saxophone that blew bubbles, and have a fun time playing classical music and these Tin Pan Alley songs, but with banjos and sound effects. Their breakout hit was De Fuhrer's Face, which was written to be used in a Donald Duck cartoon uh, in which he lives in a nightmare world of crumbs to eat, an impossible assembly line job, and constantly being told to Heil Hitler. Let's hear the chorus. When the Fuhrer says, we is the master race, we Heil, Heil, right in the Fuhrer's face, not to love the Fuhrer, is a great disgrace, so we Heil, Heil, right in the Fuhrer's face. So, <laughs> this song... <laughs> It's dumb, but this song itself was so popular that they changed the name of the cartoon from Donald Duck in Nutsyland to De Fuhrer's Face, the picture from which the song Sensation comes. 
Um, so this sort of kicked off a renaissance of novelty music, which led to things like shaving cream. Um, through this popularity, Spike Jones made records, went on tour with a musical depreciation review, and had a TV show on and off in the 50s. Um, while he performed, he wore these brightly colored checked suits, although most of the footage is black and white, uh, and the city slickers wore similar. Their big hit was Cocktails for Two, which I learned was a cover song, only through researching this talk. Um, I can't even do justice to the song, to the setup and the punchline, but I'll be um, posting a playlist of all the songs I mentioned in this talk in the Something Weird group tomorrow, so you can hear them all in full. Um, what I do have time for you is to show you Spike and the City Slickers in action. So, um, here's your standard Spike Jones setup. Even though he's a percussionist by trade, he's the band leader for the City Slickers, so he's not the primary drummer, and he doesn't sing on his own. He hosts the show and he introduces songs on records. He's always chewing gum, he often has a pistol with blanks, and also drumsticks in his hand. Um, to the left, you see a contraption. It's a washboard with car horns all over it. Uh, and then the back of that long table to the right is a custom-made cowbell xylophone that has an octave, an octave and a half of tuned cowbells. And then more, more car horns and occasionally cannons on top. Uh, you can see it a little bit from the side. So uh, let's, let's see a little clip of the show. In Napoli where love is king and a boy meets girl here's what they <laughs> so Spike once said, uh, we can play music straight and pretty as anyone if we want to, but it's more fun this way. Um, final thing about Spike Jones, um, a, a school teacher wrote, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, and in 1948, this adult man, one of the city slickers named George Rock, recorded the vocals, performed it on the show. So in addition to sort of creating this World War II novelty boom. Also, Spike Jones also created this kind of annual one-hit wonder culture that we have in the US, the novelty Christmas song. Many of these songs now are also performed from the perspective of a child. They're sung by adults, they have horns, they have silly sound effects. This all sort of comes out of the Spike Jones style. Yeah. Um, after Spike Jones, other novelty artists emerged. Alan Sherman of Hello Mata Hello Fada. Stan Freeberg, who's also a voiceover artist for Looney Tunes and Tom Lehrer, Element Song. It's good, it's a good dude. Um, Weird Al once said that these three, plus Spike Jones, were his Mount Rushmore. Um, <laughs> and uh, that he was exposed to them through the Dr. Demento Show. Um, so it first started in 1972, and it seems to have been running in one way or another ever since. Um, this popularized comedy songs and strange music like Fish Heads, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Frank Zappa, They Might Be Giants, and Weird Al himself. Um, uh, between the time between Spike Jones and Weird Al, there were parody artists for every new major genre and artist. Uh, British Invasion, Psychedelic Rock in the 70s, Hair Metal and Glam Rock in the 80s. Uh, and then Weird Al burst on the scene in uh, 1979 with My Bologna, uh, produced, uh, made in a bathrobe, <laughs> a bathroom, and then it was played on Dr. Demento. Um, the highest rated song Weird Al has ever done was White and Nerdy in 2009. It reached number nine on the Billboard Hot 100. Um, Weird Al stands alongside U2, Madonna, and Michael Jackson as the only acts who have had top 40 hits in four consecutive decades. So <laughs> it's, kind of the, it's kind of the opposite of a one-hit wonder. And uh, Chameleon Air, who wrote the song it's based on, won Best Rap Song that year, and he thanked Weird Al after, saying that being parodied by him made it undeniable that it was the rap song of the year. Um, Weird Al received a star on the Walk of, uh, uh, Walk of Fame this year, um, and Dr. Demento was at the ceremony and gave a speech. <laughs> um, but I just want to mention here at the end that uh, 
the, the real innovation that Weird Al had was that um, he embraced music videos early on. And this is a, a theme that comes up in novelty music. In the same way that uh, novelty songs are about new things, they also tend to sort of stay on the edge of technology. And so you have innovations in um, like visual gags on TV with Spike Jones. You have audio manipulation with Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, the first viral internet video on YouTube was uh, Lazy Sunday by Lonely Island. Um, and then as new things happen, usually there's a comedy song on there as well. Like they just, it's always, if you're trying to tell a new joke, you gotta continue innovating. So it seems silly, but you should associate comedy songs with innovation. Um, uh, one area of improvement is uh, the last 100 years of novelty music have almost exclusively been produced by white guys. It wouldn't be an odd salon talk without dead white guys in power making life harder <laughs> for everyone else. Um, this comes out in race, racist, racist caricatures from minstrel shows in vaudeville, German impression in Der Fuhrer's face, Monty Python's Never Be Rude to an Arab, which is just a list of slurs. Um, but basically, anything foreign has been exotic and seen as an opportunity for a joke. Same goes for women, fat people, homosexuals, people with disabilities. Cruel hum humor is lazy. Don't kick people when they're down. Don't tread on the downtrodden punch up. Um, the, the fortunate news is that it seems like with the rise of hip hop, parody songs like White and Nerdy and Lazy Sunday put the joke on the white guys themselves. Um, they see that they are not cool, and that is cool. Um, so the solution seems to be white guys making fun of themselves and having people other than white American men conceive of and perform songs. Um, so it's just uh, an amazing innovation. Who knows where you can go from here? Can you make a comedy, seven, a comedy song in seven seconds? Yes, you can. Vine has shown us that you can. Um, <laughs> these things are uh, set up in a punchline in seven seconds. They grab onto late t latest technology, but they also build on ukuleles, waltzes, pauses, swearing or almost swearing. Now that you're on the internet, you don't have to censor yourself. Um, so in general, uh, if you want to make a novelty song, Follow the trends, use new technology, write a joke that punches up, practice so you have good musicianship to tell the joke clearly, maybe include something about bananas. <laughs> um, so you have more genre op options now and fewer technical obstacles than ever before. You still need to come up with fresh jokes. So if music be the food of love, I say play with your food. <laughs> so I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do a final verse and chorus of shaving cream if you'd like to join me. You already have, so you're just, this is a victory lap. Let's do it. Him. <clears throat> and now, folks, my story is ended. I think it is time I should quit. If any of you feel offended, stick your head. 